Okay, I guess it looks like the people are very slowly still trickling in, but I think we can get started. It's uh, uh, like having a live event where people are finding parking, but I think we're, we're doing pretty well. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this informal, we hope, chat with the makers of the museum's new replica, Haya Noah Nakasak and Fred Randall. I'm Genevieve Lemoyne. I'm the curator of the Piri Macmillan Arctic Museum, and I'm speaking to you from my office where we just recently regained power. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all and our two guests. As we begin the program, I want to acknowledge the museum is located on traditional lands of the Abenaki people, members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, and also to note that today is Nunatsiavut Day, the 10th anniversary, in fact, of the official establishment of uh, home rule for the Nunatsiavut people in Labrador, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, and Noah, as you'll hear, is speaking to us from Nain in Nunatsiavut. Uh, before we get started, some a few organizational details. All you attendees are muted. So while you can see and hear us, we can't hear or see you. We do want your participation though. Um, we'll begin things with a conversation among the three of us, but then we will turn to questions from you in the, in the audience. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box um, and there we will be able to see it and we can ask them and respond to them. I can't guarantee that we'll get to all of them in the hour that we have, but hopefully we can get to many of them. Um, and you'll be able to see the questions that have already been asked so you can elaborate on them or ask different questions or whatever. Now, um, a little bit about our two guests. Noah, who's joining us from Nain in Nunatsiaba, which is the Inuit lands in Newfoundland and Labrador is the Hayek Revival Lead for the Nunatsiavut government. He's an accomplished kayaker, certified as a Level 2 Paddle Canada instructor and a Level 2 guide with the Sea Kayak Guide Alliance of British Columbia. Those are um, good, strong uh, professional skills in contemporary kayaking. And he's actively working as a Hayek Revival Lead to engage the people of Nunatsiavut in both building and using traditional and modern kayaks. Um, and you'll learn a lot more about him as we go on. Fred Randall is joining us from Georgetown, Maine, and he is an accomplished kayak builder who has created replicas of many kayaks and demonstrated kayak construction at events across the country. Together with funding from Kane Lodge Foundation and the Oak Foundation, Noah and Fred came to Brunswick in February this year, just before things shut down, luckily for us, to create the replica of the Hayek some of you may have seen in our galleries. I will show you a picture of it um, in a little bit, um, which we have recently documented as having been collected near Hopedale on the Labrador coast by members of the 1891 Bowdoin College Scientific Expedition to Labrador. So it's been here on campus since 1891. The replica, which again, we'll show pictures in a little while, is now part of the museum's newest exhibit, Hayak, which we sincerely hope you will be able to visit in person in the months to come. In the meantime, you can look at it online and I hope if you haven't already done so, you will um, we'll come and take a look at it soon. Um, I guess with that, that's enough introduction. So maybe we can just start our conversation. And I think, Noah, people are going to be very interested to know how you came to be where you are today, working on Hayek revitalization for the new Nazi Avid government. What it was about kayaks that appealed to you, how you got started in them, just a, a little bit of a background for us all. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, well, I'm, I'm Inuit or I'm an Inuit man, a uh, person, and um, Hayek use was very uh, common for uh, millennia and centuries by Inuit people. Um, I, I was inspired uh, more recently by Nigel Foster. Back in 2003, he did a Hayek trip from Kujoak to Nain. Uh, it's about 1100 1100 kilometers in in length 
and he did it through some of the most rugged terrain um, possible. Uh, extreme tides, extreme winds, uh, limited landing spots. So it's proof that uh, to me as a young, as a teenager at the time that people could still um, use the Hayek and still travel to all kinds of places. Um, so being Inuit uh, or Ninuk, a lot of people place a high value on, uh, on traveling um, and being able to travel distances is uh, important to, uh, to Inuit. So I, I like the Hayek because it's something that uh, proved um, it proved uh, you had to put your heart into it. Uh, with a speedboat, speedboat's good too, uh, but a speedboat is more about uh, financing. And the, the Hayek is more about, um, okay, I have to paddle for that distance. You know, I can't, there's no substitute. That's all on that person. And uh, speedboat is, is uh, it's again more about salary, eh? So um, I, I like the heart that you have to have to to be a good uh, to be a good kayaker, uh, uh, to be a good uh, uh, kayaker, and that's what got me uh, motivated to get further into uh, into kayaking. Yeah, yeah. And so, you, I did you start out with kayaks in name, obviously. When did you decide it was important to go to British Columbia? Because I know you went and did training there as well. I, I, I had an experience where uh, I uh, did this uh, sort of extreme trip and we, uh, we found ourselves in 60 kilometer uh, crossings without landing. Um, we found ourselves in uh, uh, 20 foot waves. You know, we found ourselves in a lot of fairly high-end situations. And um, it occurred to me that I needed to become a better paddler to um, not be reliant on other people. Um, so going to British Columbia was a, a way to become a more skilled, um, a more skilled paddler with a, with a teacher and, and not being self-taught. Uh, because when I started out in Nain, uh, there were some people who could have taught me, but they were in their 80s, he's in their 80s and kind of physically, um, uh, physical drawbacks. So uh, I, I taught going to BC, I could get a lot of instruction, which uh, when you find yourself out there on the ocean, you, um, uh, you, you take whatever you can, you know, like when you're in that kind of, environment where you know your life's on the line you're not being like well you know going to bc is going to bc that's not what i want to necessarily do but it's what i need to do to uh to become better to become a better paddler so yeah a lot of a lot of good programming out there in bc mm -hmm. So maybe Fred, just so we can hear from you as well, do you wanna, you had a very different route to getting into building and, and paddling. Do you wanna talk a little bit about how you came to, particularly how you came to build replicas, but did you start out kayaking and then get into replicas or were they your first love? Oh, you're muted, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're still muted. Get it. There we go. <laughs> uh, no, I started off uh, kayaking. Uh, and uh, I grew grew up in Maine. Yeah, I grew up on the ocean. Uh, never particularly enjoyed uh, being on the water uh, in boats. Um, but when I tried to kayak for the first time, I... Um, really fell in love with it. I, I fell in love with the connection uh, you have with the water through the kayak. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a real open relationship. And um, 
So that led me to to try a lot of kayaks. Um, being an engineer, I started forming opinions of uh, what were good styles, what were not so good styles, or trying to understand the differences in the styles. And, and um, it was at that point that I decided, being an engineer, that I could obviously build a, a better kayak and um <laughs> yeah engineers can be quite opinionated uh so uh so I, I did a little research and decided that skin on frames was probably the uh the uh the cheapest way of building a lot of uh kayaks and probably had the most uh, uh flexibility in design uh, uh to create anything you wanted and uh it was while building my first kayak that I came upon Harvey's Golden's book, which was just being released, uh, Kayaks of Greenland, which has over a hundred replicas from all over the world uh, that he went to the museums and took down the lines and a lot of information. He did it just a remarkable job. And, um, and it was really obvious uh, from that that the uh, that the Inuit the uh, these builders knew more than I could on my own learn in a lifetime and felt it made a lot more sense to uh, to build these kayaks uh, as replicas uh, to experience uh, how they behaved in the water uh, why they had these design attributes and uh, and which ones fit me best. Um, and it's, it, to some extent, it's, it's, it's a limited experience because these were hunting kayaks designed for very specific regions, uh, very specific conditions. So you, you can't experience all of that, but, but you can experience quite a bit. Um, and so I started building replicas and, uh, I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I felt really, really privileged, uh, very lucky to be able to watch both of you work on the kayak. It was really um, delightful. Maybe I can bring up, I think I can bring up a picture. Let's, we'll experiment. I'm going to um, bring up my Zoom slides. Yes, share, I'll share this and then I will just um, share. This is, uh, this is a picture of Fred and Noah in the, we were very lucky to be able to use the Outdoor Leadership Center here to, to construct the frame. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a wonderful space, lots of natural daylight. And as the curator, I got to just spend hours over there as for 10 days as they were working on this kayak, watching them. Um, and it was really, uh, it was a great learning experience for me, but I also get the sense that it was a learning experience for you two and that you, you each, you know, you brought very different things to the project. And I wonder if you would like to talk about how, you know, how that worked and how, how you, what you learned from each other and, and how you uh, worked out your differences and different approaches to building things. And, Sure, Fred, you want to go first or? Uh, no, you go ahead. Sure. Um, so Jenny, just to recap that, that was about um, what, what what we learned and and um, what we learned from each other. That was the question. Oh, well, right? yeah, just, I mean, whatever, just that, that whole experience. How did, you know, I knew you knew each other beforehand, you know, like you had met before. It wasn't like we brought two strangers, total strangers together. Well, but I, we've never worked on a project like this together. I don't. Right, think. right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no. Fred, Fred was my. Um, Fred was the first uh, 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 kayak builder that I actually knew. Like, um, and so when I knew that you were bringing uh, Fred Randall, when I knew of Fred Randall being on that, I, I was like, I gotta be there because uh, I, you know, that. I didn't have that many Hayek friends uh, 
nine years ago. And now I got like a lot, but I remember who my first ones were. So um, it was a learning experience because um, we uh, we were doing a replica of a Labrador Hayek and it was a, a replica. So um, it needed to be, it needed to match. And so uh, I, I was used to building um, like freestyle and like I was used to building what my, what my eyes saw, what my mind imagined. And uh, that's what I went off of. Uh, so I, I learned, I definitely learned a, a lot from Fred and um, about how about blueprints work and how to make them match and things like that. And uh, hopefully, you know, when the next, when we do our second uh, build, uh, can uh, gain, uh, solidify that uh, knowledge, you know, how to, I had to run with it and and uh, I paid attention, but I I really need to do it a couple more times to uh, to do the replica style. Um, yeah, so you know we had the dimensions were different uh, from a little different from what I'm used to using, and uh, uh, probably what I brought to the table in this in this instance is. Uh, you know, it was a Labrador Hayek, um, a Labrador Inuk, and I paddled uh, 2,500 kilometers when I started out in uh, skin on frame uh, high eight, and I knew what the parts were named, and I could spell them and pronounce them, and, uh, you know, I just have a good amount of enthusiasm for the Hayek and, uh, and comfort with it, too, but I, I do... You know, I listen to Fred because uh, Fred's been building, uh, you know, uh, longer than I've been building. So, um, you know, just, uh, I'm used to being independent, but working with another builder, oh my, it's really good. It's really good. There's not enough builders out there. So uh, that was really good. Yeah. Yep. And just, I just, just Fred, before you break, I want to break in just before you start commenting to tell people that Noah mentioned that he could name he named the parts and the pronunciations of the parts and things like that. And he generously let us film him naming all the parts and you can find that on the exhibit webpage. So you can, you can uh, learn quite a lot just from watching that. But Fred, mm -hmm. to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, as, as, as Noah mentioned, our, our relationship goes back, I don't know, 10 or 20 years now. Um, and, um, we have shared a lot of information, um, a lot of questions I've had. Uh, Noah has found a lot of historical information. Um, just the language alone is, is significant. Uh, he taught me a lot of, of the uh, in the terms when he was here. He was a he was a tough taskmaster. He kept at me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so so yeah but this was this was building a replica and that's something i do over and over again uh and i have specific methods of doing it um though it you always learn you always try something new every time you do it we tried new stuff um I think we learned we learned things about this kayak as as we went along, um, but yeah, and even since we built the kayak, uh, questions to know about how did they actually paddle those kayaks? Where, did they rest the paddle on the uh, on the pa the, the, the combing, or did they hold it in the air? And and, and Noah, Noah has found historical films that have been very informative. So. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we've learned a lot from each other. I think it's been a good relationship. Um, I, I, I think there's something missing in building just replicas. Um, it's much more difficult to build a replica than than freestyle. And the uh, and and the the old builders uh, uh, knew what they wanted to accomplish and didn't have to go through all the difficulties I go through to do it. They knew how to shape, shape that Appomach, the gunnel, um, to, to, to get the uh, shape they wanted. 
um, I use I use uh, a, a, a flat uh, workbench that gives me a baseline, and then I take measurements off of that. And, and uh, every six inches, and then fair out lines and cut it. It takes a lot of time. They they, they would have known uh, what those points were and been, been able to do it. So there's 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 a lot to learn. One of the things that I remember when you were building it is Noah, you were playing over the sound system interviews you had done with elders. Mm. Part of your role as Hayek Revival lead, you've been interviewing. Can you talk a little bit about that aspect? Because it was wonderful to hear them. Of course, they were speaking in an octatut, so I couldn't understand them. But um, can you talk about how important that is and what that has brought to your work? Uh, sure, yes. Uh, uh, interviewing um, elders who remember uh, Theoskan Hayek or, or Kayaks, uh, that's been that's been the most important thing I I do in my role. Um, I, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I'm a certified teacher and I'm a certified guide and an experienced teacher and experienced guide and experienced builder. I can do a variety of things I can write, etc. But uh, the uh, for me, yeah, hands down uh, is uh, being able to uh, have um, uh, these these people on uh, on record and uh, being able to uh, ask uh, fairly detailed questions and have it on again record, but being able to uh, share it because of the uh, the time zone that we're doing it in because you know, it's internet age and, you know, I can upload files to a folder, you know, I can share them with uh, colleagues uh, and et cetera. So they're not going to burn down in a, in a house fire and destroy it forever anymore. Um, yeah, so having the elders, uh, interviewing those elders, it's important, be very, very important because uh, their stories have, their Hayek stories haven't been uh, uh, shared before. Uh, a lot of the times people go like, uh, Inuit had Hayek, Inuit had Hayek, good, okay. That's kind of like the end of the conversation of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for example, with one interview um, in particular, we had uh, 69 pages of uh, information uh, transcribed aboard it. Uh, that's with some English, but majority any So, um, you're hearing who you really should have been hearing from all along is, is directly from the source of uh, people who, uh, you know, uh, hunted uh, beluga whale, uh, we know in all the seasons using the kayak, you know, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall, uh, just a great deal of information that uh, you, you can't even sometimes find in the archives. So the archives have their own uh, very useful information but uh, there's like subtleties to the interviews that um, that um, make them very special. And what's sad is that I was like the first uh, person to really actually ask them about Hayek use. Uh, they haven't really been asked about Hayek use in geez, probably 60 years, probably longer, 50, 60 years. No one's asked them. So it was really important to get it on record and um, we're, we're, we're pretty fortunate that we were able to do that. You know, we're talking like this was done in 2018. So we're, we're pretty fortunate to be able to, uh, to get that this, this late and um, this late. Yeah, so that's, that's again been extremely important, yes. Um, I we can, I think we can give, we can somewhere maybe put up the URL of the website where the people can see those interviews. I know some of them have been translated into English. Some of them are in English to begin with, aren't they? Um, uh, yeah, three of them, yeah, three of the younger, uh, uh, the younger interviewees uh, could have done them in Inuktitut, but for some reason did them in English that day. So uh, yeah, for yeah. some reason. 
we can, I think there's a link to it on our exhibit webpage, but we can also put it in the Q and A here or something as yeah, if you want to listen to them. Yeah, yeah there's, there's good stuff in there. I mean, if you're in, I mean, I'm sure, hopefully you're all in the Hayek stuff if you're <laughs> webinar, but uh, there's stuff in there that uh, nuggets that you definitely, that you won't even find in some of the, uh, some of the very good books out there. There's very, very, very good books out there in Hayek, uh, Hayek history, but there's um, things, little pieces of information that come out in those interviews that you, you don't necessarily always see in the uh, in the books that I wrote today. So uh, yeah, it's it's if you're in the Hayek, um, Hayek uh, information, uh, then yeah, that's, that's really a, an excellent place to go for that. Um, I have one other thing that I was interested in um, I know, Fred, mostly when you, when anyone builds replica high uh, skin on frame boats, they're usually based on Greenlandic models. And the Nunazi Ava Hayek is kind of different. And I'll, I can, I can bring up a picture of them. Hang on a minute. Uh, if I share my screen. Again, uh, there we go. Share that, and the picture is oh, it's hiding underneath all of you. Sorry, it uh, the window gets hidden. There it is. So this is just so people can see. This is the original 1891 Hayek. Many people who've been in the museum will have seen it before, and this is the the replica that they built. So it's an exact copy without the skin because that's we wanted people to be able to see the frames. But if you're used to looking at, or if you have looked at Greenlandic Hayek, this one is, it's so long, it's broader, the, the cockpit is bigger, the paddle that you can see up here is so long and thin. They're very, very different. Um, and I wonder if you can, both of you or either of you, whoever wants, sorry, I'm going to get rid of that. Stop sharing. Um, <laughs> what those differences are and why, you know, why is a Labrador kayak different from a Greenlandic kayak? Just so people understand. Jenny, could you go back to the, uh, the picture in the museum? Yep. Oh, wait a minute. I have to share my screen first. Yeah. not fast enough with my mouse. There, is that, can you see it all? Yes, that's great. Okay. Hopefully everyone else can. Uh, you know, I was, I was, I was looking at, at this picture and, and of course, uh, one of the striking differences you can see very well on the, on the kayak hanging from the wall is the lack of symmetry. Notice, notice how narrow it, and long it is in front and in back the width, uh, is uh, is much fuller, and the the cockpit um, on a and that's not true of a Greenland kayak. Greenland ki kayaks in general are are very symmetrical, uh, and I won't speak about the early polar uh, Greenland kayaks. Uh, they're really a Baffin style kayak, much more like this. But but uh, but yeah. So the, so just 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 difference in the symmetry um, between the two. And, uh, and because you have all that additional volume in the back, you have to move the, the combing, the pa, uh, the opening, the cockpit has to move back. It's, it's not centered. And, and that's more, interestingly, that's, that's more what, what I would think of seeing in a badaka. A badaka is, is much fuller in the back. Uh, narrower in the front. Um, being an Alaskan style? Yes, exactly. The Badaka from the uh, Aleutian Islands. Um, then uh, if, if you look at the, the combing, the pa, uh, and you can see that on the, uh, the replica uh, quite well. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's much, 
one is it's it's much taller, it's much uh, wider, uh, three three and a quarter inches wide compared to the uh, to the Greenland kayaks, which are which are much smaller, um, and uh, and then uh, the 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 paw the, the the combing is is resting on a deck beam. We call it the mastic, and you can see how tall it is. It's, it's very high. The, uh, the the Greenland mastic is much lower. Um, uh, it's it's it can be very difficult to get in. They they would uh, sometimes carve hand grips on the bottom side of the mastic just to just to help them uh, wiggle in. A very very tight fit. Uh, but this is this is much different than that. Um, like Noah, would you say that this is better for the water? Is it designed this way for the water conditions in Labrador? Or uh, I, I think uh, builders, uh, even hundreds of years ago, um, went in uh, in different directions. So the 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 concept of the Hayek is the same, but uh, uh, the, there are subtleties. As uh, as Fred noted, and um, with the Labrador Hayak, you you uh, you tend to have a, a flat hull. Um, you can see the, the hull shape is is flat, and and uh, green some Greenland high high have that as well, but they tend to be more uh, um, uh, more uh, curved, more V shaped, or or more curved. Um, the uh, the Labrador Hayak it, it is bigger, but it, even though in being larger, it, it doesn't look like uh, clumsy. I mean, uh, it's larger, yes, and uh, but you can see like if I was going to use the Hayak and in the photograph there, I mean, I would be uh, I'd be happy to to use it um, because it, it looks very elegant. Uh, looks. Uh, you know, very refined, and um, uh, um, you sure we build that? No, but uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding now. But uh, it, yeah, anyway, it looks very good, and so um, it, it's uh, the uh, you know different different wants from uh, different uh, users. Like uh, I was told uh, by my uh, by my elders that. Uh, um, you know, uh, people would put uh, a caribou some uh, in the Hayak in the in, in Labrador and uh, or uh, a bearded seal uh, in the Hayak as well. So they were they were putting um, uh, they could have wanted a larger Hayak so that they make them easier for to carry uh, to carry all the meat uh, mm -hmm. that they yeah. had to carry. Um, so. Yeah, like it's yeah, it's basically a, a little larger, flatter bottom. Uh, the back would be harder, you know, to do a roll in because it's so it's so tall, and and uh, like Fred was saying, the mastic is uh, pretty pretty curved, so the have some really bent legs to get a roll in there. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's just what different builders are, are looking for, and and each each were achieving. Um, each were achieving uh, great things. I mean, Labrador Inuit, like there's a long list of accomplishments. Uh, good place over the hour, but there's a long list of accomplishments uh, where that they did. And, uh, you know, Greenland Inuit are, are very well known, uh, very well published on uh, in their Hayek work yeah. or use. And, and so um, both were doing phenomenal things in, in Hayek, phenomenal things. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think maybe turn to, I've got to open the window, turn to the questions because we're starting to get questions from the audience, um, if that's all right with you. Um, and I'll start with uh, Marianne who asked, are there memories among women elders in Nain of being in an umiak or was the umiak replaced too long ago by shallops or other wooden boats? 
yeah, the Umiak, uh, as people think of the Umiak, um, yeah, that was that went earlier uh, than the Hayak. So the Hayak was Labrador is not all the same. There's subtlety, definitely subtleties within Labrador. So me living in Labrador and researching Labrador, you know, Hayak, sometimes Umiak history. Um, uh, there's differences up and down the coast. So we're talking a coast that has like, this is very rough now, but a thousand kilometers in length. So there were um, um, influences by, uh, sometimes interferences and influenced by uh, settlers, uh, white white settlers uh, during, uh, uh, along the coast. Mm -hmm. But uh, to answer Mary, Mary, Marianne's question, um, uh, the Umiak, you can today uh, talk to, no, it was replaced too early to um, to talk about really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's my, and Susan is muted, so she's not gonna answer, but my impression is that very early on, even in the 17th century already, people were using boats that they'd gotten from whalers or traders or whatever, wooden boats, as opposed yeah, to yeah, yeah. still using well, Hayek, but for large. Yeah, well, it was going good in the 1800s. It was going decently, I guess you could say, in the 1800s. But yeah. uh, but by the 1900s, um, no, not, not not in the sense of a Umiak frame, a, a real Umiak frame, and uh, with skin, with um, any kind of covering. Yeah. Um, uh, the knowledge to know how to make Umiak didn't necessarily go though. So the Umiak itself yeah. went, but um, there was an Umiak made in Nain in, I believe it was 1971 for the bicentennial celebration. Yeah. Uh, so people in 1971 could construct an Umiak out of like basically traditional mm -hmm. knowledge, uh, but the, the Umiak itself was, um, was, uh, was there. And so this is this this is a question that could take up quite a lot of time, um, I think. But nevertheless, it's important. Um, that is, what materials? <coughs> excuse me. What materials did you choose to build the Hayak, the frame? <coughs> he also says the skin, which we didn't put us. We, we won't put a skin on it. But the, for the frame and the fittings, and this is a question from Mike Hamilton. So that's. You both, I know, wanna, discussions back and forth about the materials. If, if you show a picture, I can maybe point to or you can point to the parts, and I could talk about the materials. Yep. The, Let me get back to the picture. There we go. There. Okay. So there's the picture. So the uh, the Appamox, the gunnels. Uh, uh, can you? Put a pointer on the uh oh wait a minute what about with this yes that's great yeah the the uh the uh the apple mox the gunnels the uh board along the side uh is uh lumbered wood uh as is the uh um and it's just white wood spruce uh the side shines uh the the Bottom chines and the Kilson are all spruce. The uh, the deck beams, I think, in general were spruce. Uh, the pa, the combing was uh, red oak. Um, the ribs, uh, combination of uh, of ash, uh, white ash. Uh, uh, locally sourced from a friend's uh, woodlot and uh, and some red oak. Um, yeah, and the uh, the deck stringers were again uh, white wood. Uh, so a lot of spruce uh, and uh, red oak. Uh, ash is good for beams. Uh, Red oak is good for beams. I mean, for uh, ribs. Sorry. Um, yeah. Then the uh, 
Uh, for lashing, we don't really show the lashing here, but for for lashing, uh, a lot of uh, uh, twine from the marine store uh, and a lot of uh, a, a lot of the uh, the wood nails, the dowels are uh, are oak. Yeah, I think that covers most of it. No, am I missing anything? No, oh, that was that was that was good. Yeah. And how does that compare, Noah, to what you would use in Maine if you were to build? Well, when eventually we will be building a replica in Maine as well. So. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, we in in this uh, in this replica, uh, we used a lot of um, store bought uh, wood, which it's uh, much faster to work with. Um, but we did run into issues because uh, store-bought wood is kiln dried, and so uh, the moisture content is brought so low that the uh, wood is more in the thicker areas, like the upper mark, the it's prone to snapping. Um, so uh, when I actually find it's a lot more work to use wood from the uh, greenwood or wood from the trees, but it's easier in the end because the uh, the shapes, the curves, the curve the curves within the hayak um, are a lot easier to achieve with the um, or with non kiln drying wood, not not store wood. Um, yeah, so I mean we in main uh, uh, we'd be using. Uh, uh, to, uh, same kind of uh, like sailor's twine and, and same kind of uh, Alex spruce personally because it's um, it's a local wood and we only have a few species spruce, uh, birch and uh, juniper. Um, so uh, Alex spruce, uh, I like juniper for the harder areas uh, like the ribs or the uh, or the combing, uh, park. Um, so yeah. I know I've heard in the past that they'd use uh, uh, sinew, you know, for tying, uh, you know, like uh, from caribou leg, because uh, a caribou is sinew is tougher in the legs area because it, it's more more force is put on there. Um, but it's also a lot of work to do. It's a lot easier to uh, to get it in a roll, you know. But um, but yeah, so. Yeah, well, what we'd be doing is similar in name, just uh, uh, just using you know more natural wood, I guess, but more um, wood, local wood. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as I mentioned, we are not ever going to cover this one. But if you wanted to paddle it, you'd have to cover it. So what what would you in in name these days? What would you use to cover it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're using uh, uh, these these days. We're we're using what uh, what what you know, Fred and and uh, a lot of builders around North America are using, which is uh, ballistic nylon, twelve ounce uh, twelve ounce ballistic nylon uh, coated with polyurethane. Uh, I know um, my great grandfather Sim Nokosak, He had a sealskin hayak because that's what everybody had in his generation. Um, but the drawback to seal skin that people kind of lose sight of is um, dogs, you always had to keep it on a stand to, uh, so the dogs wouldn't rip it to shreds, literally. Uh, there's a record of a dog ripping the high uh, to shreds and even because the order of the seal skin was on the wood, the dogs just not destroy the frame too. Uh, with steel skin, you have to worry about the uh, polar bears because uh, marble polar bears because uh, the polar bear, uh, you know, eats seals and uh, will eat seal skin as well. So um, you're baiting it in a sense there. And also with seal skin, you have to have uh, you have to have a great deal more sewing, um, and so you need a, you need more help. Uh, 
or you have to be a lot more self-reliant either way it's it's a lot more work um so seal skin it's, it's really good i i've paddled a seal skin hayak before uh, ross flowers one in hopedale uh really uh, truly enjoyed it but um in terms of creating it uh it's easier to have ideas aboard it than it is to do it because uh with seal skin again you have to um realize this is going in the ocean and it's going to go in the ocean for the full day um your sewing everything aboard it has to be uh, uh better more detailed you know you're not making uh mitts here mitts are good too but you're not making mitts it's more serious application so um yeah so i, I like seal skin I'm, I'm not trying to i'm just trying to set people in a reality path here of, of uh of the extra efforts that are uh, involved in uh, seal oh, yeah. skin. and definitely the skill that sewing skill is remarkable to to make so this is just so people know the photograph up on the screen now this was taken by that 1891 expedition we don't know if it's our kayak it was taken in the same place around the same time as the one we have was collected. But you can see this frame, the stand that it's on. And you can also see that he's holding his, a paddle, very, very long, slender paddle. And um, Paul Brubacher has asked, um, have either of you done any research on the Labrador paddles or, try, or used this kind of paddle? Um, Jenny, if, if I could just say, it's a really beautiful picture uh, that you have up on the screen. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> and, and again, it, and this is kind of, I'll get back to the paddle, we can get back to the paddle, but I just wanted to mention, if you talk about um, the differences between a Greenland kayak and a Labrador kayak, one of the most striking differences is the aft of the uh, paw. And you can see how the width keeps decreasing as you go aft. It gets narrower and narrower. This is very unlike a Greenland kayak where the width stays very constant going aft until you until you get to the um, until you get to the, uh, the the stem piece in the end. Uh, there can be some shape in there. There could be an internal uh, skeg or whatnot, but in general, that that width is not like that. And and you can you can see from the picture that there's what we call rocker. That would be the the the, the keel, the, the top of the kayak, as it's shown here. But that would be the keel. You can see how it, there's a curve as it heads toward the stern, which would be the rocker. But the back deck is also. Uh, uh, slanting down is, is not level. So you have you have what you would say is kind of a V shape uh, aft of the uh, of the pa, which is a very interesting uh, design. Mm -hmm. And then of course it's full width going forward uh, uh, as you start to get a little bit of that the uh, the shear line on the bow that starts you know going upward and and that keel stays very straight. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, I have not really done anything uh, with with the uh, Labrador paddle, even though I have taken the lines off the one at the museum. I haven't gotten around to trying to build a paddle uh, yet, but but I have plans to do that maybe this winter. I don't know. <laughs> Whenever I can find some time. What about, you know, have you used a paddle like a traditional paddle? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've used a, a traditional paddle, but uh, not not um. Uh, so I have a paddle that's really Greenland in shape. Uh, I, I remember I brought it to my uh, grandfather one time because he paddled as a teenager. I asked him what he thought of my paddle and he told me it was, you know, it should have been longer uh, because the, the, the Labrador uh, paddle is, is uh, longer than the Greenland uh, paddle. 
um, it's got to be longer to match the, the bigger height. Um, I know, so I don't have a lot of person. I don't have personal experience with the the paddle like that that man uh, in the photograph has, because uh, his paddle is is larger uh, is larger than uh, than my paddle. Um, all I have is that uh, elders, uh, my elders, uh, have told me that uh, my paddle should basically be longer, and um, <laughs> and that uh, yeah, to be uh, a strong man because uh, the stronger men had bigger paddles. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I don't have a lot, but we know we have the same word, uh, poutic, and they say poutic, so the words are. Uh, like our word for paddles, the exact same word that Greenland uh, Inuit have for, for paddle as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got two blades. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, some some people uh, say uh, iputik, but iputik is for a uh, single bladed paddle, and uh, uh, pautik is for a uh, double bladed uh, paddle. But uh, so, yeah, it's something. Yeah, I do uh, want to do more next summer, have a paddle that long just to, uh, to show my grandfather and be like, yeah, I did it too, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something I learned while I was researching for the exhibit was, which I was surprised at, I guess, is that in Alaska, they did sometimes use single bladed paddles and often on their kayak, they would have both a double and a single bladed uh, paddle for use under different circumstances. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that in the East? No, not myself. I haven't, I haven't asked. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I really asked that if I got a, a few answers out of that. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't asked, but I, I I will tell you a really short story. One time uh, when I was a guide, a uh, kayak guide, um, tour groups aren't always the fastest paddlers. So to kind of entertain myself, I uh, I wound up taking the paddle apart and just paddling with uh, like a single bladed paddle. Mm -hmm. And I was still, still faster than the people who are using <laughs> double bladed. Battle, so I just uh, single blade. It, it can it can work. It, it, uh, <laughs> it's not my go-to, but it can work. Yeah, it definitely. Can work. <laughs> um, so yeah. we have another question, which is really for you, Noah. It's from Caroline Poole, who says, "Great to see you again, Noah." Um, and she asks. Uh, well, she does comment on the hats in the background and she does say, go Leafs, go, which I was gonna say too, but um, <laughs> what sorts of programs do you run at home when, in, you know, as, as part of your program, what are you doing in the community? Sure, uh, hey, Carolyn, um, what do I do? So I, I do, oh man, I, I, I basically try to fill a large gap uh, that nobody before me is really filled. Um, you know, I came in with a lot of Hayek passion, Hayek knowledge, and uh, uh, I hadn't been seen in, in many decades. So um, in Labrador. Um, so yeah, uh, my, my pro the program I, I lead, it's, um, uh, it's the three things really. So I, I teach people how to paddle. Uh, um, in all seasons on the ice, you know, from transitioning from ice to water, I teach them, a lot of them have never sat in a kayak before, you know, so I I basically build up their skill levels. Um, I teach them how to build, uh, here's how to build a kayak, uh, skin and frame style. And um, I do a lot of research uh, with archeologists and uh, archivists and uh, uh, Museums, so it, it's really good. Um, uh, ironically, some of my stronger suits is my kayaking ability, but it's what I really like is uh, being able to do archival work and uh, 
learn learn more about the about history here and have more examples. I do a lot of things. Yeah, I, I do a lot of things. Um, I do everything that's connected to Hayek in, in Labrador, basically. Yeah, I do a lot of things. Do you want to talk about the, the storage places that you're having, that they're building? Yeah, they're building a, a world, uh, not world, but a national class uh, Hayek training facility uh, 60 kilometers north of Nain. Uh, so, you know, I've traveled from Vancouver, I worked from Vancouver Island to St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, up to here. And um, I've seen you know, many of the uh, training grounds that uh, people have been instructing uh, a lot longer than I have uh, where, they, where they use those areas. But this area which we're building in Maine, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's a national class training ground. Um, it's got open seats, it's got tidal currents, it's got sheltered water. All within the space of each other, a few, you know, a few hundred meters even. Uh, it's got the mountain weather. It's got the polar bears. So it, it trains people how to be not comfortable with polar bears, but be uh, should never be comfortable with polar bears. But it teaches them how to be uh, um, experienced, a little bit more experienced on polar bears, eh? And uh, uh, how to you know read weather that can change more quickly like in the mountain areas so yeah that's one of the big items that we're completing uh this year yeah yeah at yeah, least are doing yeah leafs are at least at least need they're gonna win someday yeah they're gonna win someday. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um so we've got we haven't got too much time there's uh let's see if we can ask a few more questions um Juan Pablo Valdez, who is here from Chile, he wanted to ask if you know or have information about an expedition of Count Guido Monzino in 1971. I don't know. I have not heard of it. I don't know. Have either of you heard of it? We'll, no. look, we'll look into that. He's left an email and I can get back to him about that. He also wanted to know about using sleds and kayaks. Um, He's asking about sleds as a kind of makeshift kayak to, to cross, he says crevasse, I think he means leads in the ice, um, but also I would guess to get kayaks out onto the ice. Do you have? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's so yeah, uh, hamutit or uh, wooden sledges, they were, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was common to, you know, have a kayak on top of a wooden, uh, wooden sledge and, uh, to, to bring it out to the uh, ice edge or, or to bring it, you know, um, where you think you might need it. So the, the Hayek was a valuable tool uh, that needs water. So, but even though when it's minus 20, 30 and minus 40, there's still places that have um, open water, uh, you know, uh, by tidal current or by wind. So yeah, using uh, the Hayek was, uh, wasn't restricted to uh, summer use. It, it was something that was, uh, you know, used three seasons, you know, uh, fairly heavily and uh, went also in the winter, but not, not as heavily, but still used. Um, so yeah, it's not an interesting, uh, interesting uh, question. Yeah, that, that Hayek and Hamutik or wooden sledge were uh, combined. It's true. Yeah. And so this is also a question for both of you. Um, Milton is asking, considering the different sizes and shapes of, and we talked about this a little bit, but the different sizes and shapes of Greenland and Labrador high, um, whether it was indeed a question of carrying things inside versus carrying things on the deck of the Hayek, if that was a primary, I guess, a primary design consideration. Does that, am I asking that correctly? That's <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, do you want to go first, Fred, or, uh, or I can? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really have any, you know, personal knowledge. It's, uh, you know, all hearsay or things I've read, but certainly that's at least what I've been told that 
that they were able to use that volume, uh, and I think you even mentioned it to to uh, put you know to put caribou or or seal or whatnot in there to carry back home. And I know the Greenland kayaks you couldn't do that. There wasn't enough volume. Uh, you couldn't even really put the seal on the back deck. You you had to float it back, and and uh, they had gear uh, specifically designed to to facilitate that. So uh, that certainly that's part of uh, how those design differences led to differences in getting the catch back. Um, but but whether that was a design decision or or an afterthought, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I the interesting adjective there is like I think primary um, consideration. I I do know like sort of like. Very... Uh oh. Uh oh. I think we've lost them temporarily. Hopefully, temporarily. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, one thing that I think is common throughout Labrador is very strong currents. Um, so dragging in a uh, uh, a dead animal uh, alongside your kayak might be very difficult. Uh, in uh, in, uh, in Labrador, for um, being able to either fit in, you know. Uh, uh, again, a caribou or a uh, seal, or you know, make it easier to uh, carry people uh, because people also were uh, were carried uh, on top of the kayak. Like you could have two people, uh, one on the bow, one towards the bow side, one towards the stern side of the kayak, and um, you, you would need uh, more volume uh, to transport. You know, like several hundred more pounds. So. Uh, more important. So yeah, they needed a larger hayek for uh, for things like that. It's also no, easier for them. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask. Do, do you think because of the uh, strong currents uh, along the Labrador coast uh, that dragging a, a a seal or an animal alongside your kayak would be more problematic than in Greenland? Um, you know, that it would tend to uh, make it more difficult to control because of those strong currents? Uh, no, no, um, I don't, I don't believe, I don't, I don't think so, Fred. Uh, it's a good, really good question though, but uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, just being paddling up and down a few thousand kilometers on the coast, uh, the currents here, there are spots where they're strong, but for the most part, they're not. They're not. That, they're not that bad, really. Okay. Um, Would they? Yeah. Like a walrus or or whaling when they were whaling, those yeah. also. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. 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 I mean, Greenland, Inuit were wal uh, walrus hunting as well, but uh, yeah, they, yeah they were definitely walrus hunting, uh, blue whale hunting, polar bear hunting from Hayek, so. Uh, my my grandfather used to uh, you know set the bar. He used to say that uh, people uh, hunted uh, polar. You know his father uh, hunted uh, polar bear from from Haya. Mm -hmm. So you know that's, that's sort of setting uh, the bar. Though walrus mm -hmm. hunting is supposed to be more more dangerous actually yeah. uh, because of the maneuverability. But um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean the. Uh, they did, they, they, yeah. Well, we're. Uh, oh, yeah. I want to say, I want, uh, they had more access to wood. I mean, I mean Greenland Inuit had, had wood too. Uh, but I know in Labrador, we, we had uh, we had more wood. Um, you know, there's trees not far from here, this house right now, there's trees that are you know, bigger in size and uh, whatnot. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah, that, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, there is a lot. A lot easier to get good wood in Labrador. Yeah. For sure, yeah. Not yeah. For sure. So we're we're running out of time. It's a little past eight o'clock, and I you know some people have to to get on. Um, there's we're now the questions now are are almost mostly um, thanking you both for all the knowledge that you've uh, 
uh, shared with people today. Um, and for uh, I'll check the name, Mark Long, particularly Noah is thanking you for um, capturing critical knowledge, he says, contained in the art, not contained in the archives and that he's looking forward to reading the interviews. And Michelle Smith also wants to thank you for sharing your knowledge and just comments on how much there is to learn. Um, and just one, this is one last question that I'll ask, although I know the answer and I, I'll let you answer it, Noah. Uh, Jared Beitman is asking, does the ferry terminal or airport in Maine honor the legacy of the kayak to the region with an exhibit? And of course, there's not a ferry terminal or airport per se is there where you would put an exhibit. Uh, well, Jenny, you, you could probably articulate the answer better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for those who aren't, the, I, I've never arrived in the ferry, but there is no terminal to speak of. And the airport is just a one tiny little office and you wait outside the planes and things like that. So there's not really an opportunity for an exhibit, but there is a new cultural center, Elusuak, um, and I presume in there, Noah, that the exhibits do mention kayak. It's hard not to. I mean, like anytime you talk about uh, Inuit uh, history, uh, whether whether you intend to or not, you're you're going to run into uh, the term kayak. It's just you know, it's just yeah. <laughs> uh, really strong, strong part of the culture, and uh, so. Any, any exhibit that has anything to do with Inuit culture is, is going to have Hayak in there for sure. So uh, Iluswak does follow that suit because right. yeah, I mean, it's cultural visits. But yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad that the, the Labrador uh, Hayak is, is uh, getting uh, uh, some recognition because uh, you know, I'm very, uh, I have Greenland friends uh, in, in Greenland and uh, really admire uh, what they what they do and have done. Um, but that uh, Hayek use also happened in Labrador uh, as well and uh, in Canada. And uh, we're the smallest, one of the, you know, us in Inuvialuit, we're the smallest uh, region in, uh, in Canada. So even within, um, Canadian Inuit were like uh, we're a smaller area, so it's good to see that the uh, the Labrador Inuk is good to see the uh, you know Hayak being Labrador Hayak also getting you know some some acknowledgement too. So that, that's really good. I'm really glad you guys sincerely were able to to do that and uh, and yeah and, and and everyone for sh showing up. I know everyone <laughs> yeah or or live. In general, you know, it's it's uh, hard to find time. So yeah, I'm glad people were uh, able to able to join us, and uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I am. So yeah, I'd like to thank you both, and thank all our audience members for coming. And I hope you do come and visit our virtual exhibit, and I hope soon you can come and visit the real exhibit uh, and see the replica in person because it's amazing. And hopefully we'll do, we did, we mentioned briefly, the second part of this project is actually to have Fred and museum staff go to Nain and build a replica there. It was supposed to happen this summer, obviously it didn't. Who knows whether it can happen next summer, but at some point it is gonna happen. And so we'll hopefully be able to report back to people on, on that part of the project as well. Yeah, I'm slowly starting to build a 32 foot shed, so we'll have a place to. Oh, manage. good, yeah, <laughs> big enough place to work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really, really looking forward to that day, and yeah. uh, I really, am, so I really. Am. As I, as, as am I. I've uh, already started to source some more ash to bring up with me if I can, and uh, and maybe I can bring up some of the wood, and uh, and hoping to learn how to do some seal hunting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For, sure. Okay. for sure. For sure. All right. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. You guys. You guys. <laughs>